everyone, it's me again, back with another Godzilla review. This time, it's the 20th film in the series and the fourth film of the Heisei era, 1993's Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla 2. Once again, we have some epic poster art. That too in the title is a bit deceiving. This is not a sequel to 1974's Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla. On the contrary, their positions are actually reversed in this movie, where before Mechagodzilla was an offensive weapon operated by an invading alien race and Godzilla had to come fight it and rescue the Earth twice, here Mechagodzilla is our creation, an ultimate defensive weapon against Godzilla developed by scientists using robotic alien technology from the future from the past, a couple movies ago. So, aside from reusing the name and the mecha design, this movie doesn't really have anything to do with the old film. In addition to the main Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla conflict, there's another storyline that eventually ties in involving the discovery of two eggs of moderately large size. I won't say they're giant because we've seen much bigger. One is a Pteranodon egg from which has hatched Rodan. So not only are they bringing Mechagodzilla from the Showa era into the Heisei era, but Rodan as well. The other egg is brought back for testing and observation, and it also hatches, revealing a new character, Baby Godzilla, also known as Godzilla Jr. He's a non-aggressive, plant-eating godzilla sore whose egg attached itself parasitically to Rodan's egg. Baby Godzilla has an unusual bond with Rodan, also with Godzilla, also with the female scientist who runs tests on it, who it thinks is its mother? There's a lot to digest in this movie, and there were quite a few times when I couldn't decide if what was happening was fun, or cool, or creative, or just stupid. <laughs> It gets off to a good start. My mom thought this was one of the best beginnings, with its advanced for the time technology and serious music. The first of several times Ifakube's nice, rich score helps the movie maintain a certain level of gravity, even when crazy things are happening. We got to watch a version that wasn't dubbed. Yay! That's so much better. For the most part, um, it's definitely better to hear the actors' natural voices and not have that comical lack of synchronization between the audio and the visual. So, huge improvement there. That being said, there were still some comical moments with the dialogue. There are quite a few English lines sprinkled in here and there, since there's supposed to be an international team of fighters working together, and sometimes these lines are spoken by American performers who aren't very good at acting, but sometimes they're spoken by heavily accented Japanese performers who could have used a little more language coaching. The result is kind of unfortunate. But the good thing is that we had subtitles for all the dialogue, both Japanese and English. This one has more monsters in it than the previous Heisei era Godzilla films, if we're counting Mechagodzilla as a monster. Technically, he's not. He's a mecha, not a kaiju, but whatever. We'll count him as one. In Godzilla vs. Biolanti and Godzilla vs. King Ghidra, there's only the one kaiju enemy, although with the changes they go through, it seems like more. Godzilla vs. Mothra Battle for Earth bumps it up to three by adding Batra to the mix, and now in this movie, we have four. Godzilla enters the picture in yet another awesome introductory sequence. Does Godzilla have any mediocre introductions? For the most part, the Heisei Godzilla hasn't exhibited many human-like attributes, a sharp contrast to, or refutation of, some of the more flamboyant and notorious Showa-era portrayals. I noticed more personality from him in this one, however, especially when it comes to Mecha Godzilla. Every time they face each other, I get the impression that Mechagodzilla infuriates and disgusts Godzilla. He's got a special loathing for this thing that dares to imitate him. Which brings us back to Mechagodzilla, who is modeled after the 1974 design, but isn't exactly the same as he was the first time around. Instead of being operated remotely by aliens, he's operated from the inside by a team of highly trained G-Force, that's Godzilla Defense Force, pilots and fighters. They've also tweaked the external design a bit, giving Mechagodzilla some well-defined pecs, kneecaps, abs, 
Wow, the attention to detail on this giant robot is interesting. G-Force has worked very hard to put this thing together, but it does have its hang-ups. It takes an awful long time for it to get into battle-ready position. The plasma grenade works great, as long as Godzilla waits around for you to fire it, and you can't use it for too long or its energy will be depleted and your whole system will start overheating. Technical difficulties abound with this thing. He does come with a backup plan, though. There's another older machine, which attaches to Mechagodzilla's back, transforming him into Super Mechagodzilla. The kaiju I was most excited to see again was Rodan, who hasn't shown up in a Godzilla movie since Destroy All Monsters in 1968. Like Mechagodzilla, Rodan looks a little different than he did in his original incarnation. I think he's even more bird-like in his mannerisms, pecking mercilessly at his adversary's head and eyes. And partway through the film, he regenerates in a burst of red fire and gold dust, oh my goodness, there it is again, into a new form called Fire Rodan. The fourth kaiju, Baby Godzilla, or Godzilla Jr., was a surprise, but thank goodness not a completely terrible one. At first I was doubtful, but he grows on you, there is something cute about him. Cuter than Manila in Son of Godzilla, that's for sure. And the bond between Baby and Azusa the female scientist is endearing in its own way. But it is a little odd, and that's generally how I feel about the whole movie. My internal monologue through much of it was basically... Oh, that's cool, I guess. Kinda weird, though. This didn't hamper my ability to have fun with the movie, but I do think I might have enjoyed it more overall if I hadn't had this unsure, unconvinced reaction to so many things. The fight scenes in this one also seem slower and especially lengthy. I know when you boil it down, the fights are what a lot of people are coming to these movies looking for, and so it's no surprise that a considerable amount of time is spent on them. There sure were a lot of them here. First battles, rematches, three-way fights. Each one gets a little more intense and more violent until the final battle ends in a cacophony of mass explosions and fire. The ending is interesting, with Rodan's sacrifice done in a shower of gold and white glitter, of course, and Godzilla getting supercharged and breathing red fire instead of blue. That was cool. And the main character's crisis of conscience over what to do with Baby was a thoughtful touch, as was Mickey's sudden feelings of conflict about being the one to push the button to end it all. She takes on quite a bit of responsibility in this film. Good character growth for her. You know, as much skepticism or confusion as I've expressed or hinted at regarding certain elements of this movie, I don't think that it's as out there as some of the previous Heisei-era films have been. At the moment, I have no idea how I'd rank this one. Maybe the more I think about it, the better I'll like it. That has happened before. Biolanti's grown on me since I did that review. I can say decisively, though, that between old Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla and Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla 2, I liked the original Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla better. That first Mechagodzilla reveal was just so good. Alright, I think that's about all I have to say about this one. I hope you enjoyed the review. Let me know your own thoughts on this movie in the comments down below if you like, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching!